So I would now like to introduce our first speaker, Sally Ray. Now, Sally Ray here is, works for the Otago Daily Times in Dunedin as the agribusiness reporter and has been awarded for her ability to communicate the complexities of our industry as well as the good stories. Sally has a number of journalism awards, filling her mantelpiece, and in 2019 became the first woman in Otago Southland, uh, in Otago Daily Times, sorry, in its 158-year history to be appointed as its business editor, and another first as a woman as its rural editor. With over 25 years of experience, Sally is going to share the true side of print media and the best way to approach them for your stories. So welcome Sally Ray, and we'll hand the floor over to you. Hi everybody, thanks Olivia for the introduction and thanks everybody for tuning in today and I hope you get some value from this session. If there's one take home message that I'd like you to take away today, uh, it would be that the media, contrary to public opinion, uh, is not actually out to get, the, out to get you. Uh, and that there are real opportunities that exist to work with the media to push out really positive um, farming stories, and particularly to the urban public. The media is a little bit like farming, I guess, in that probably 99% are doing a really good job, and maybe there's 1% of rat bags, or not necessarily even rat bags, but just people that don't understand farming. Uh, and as that disconnect gets wider where people don't have an aunt or a grandparent or any connection with the land it makes it more and more difficult um, in the media to ha actually have knowledge of the farming sector so often it's not the fact that they have an agenda it's just that they don't understand standard farming practices that you and I all you know are, are aware of. The media is not a particularly comfortable um, place to be at the moment. Um, I had a friend in Wellington the other day who was actually chased down the street and threatened um, by some of those nice protesters um, outside Parliament. But I'd just like you to think for a moment of what the world would be like if there was no media, no traditional media, and we were relying on social media for all our information about whether it was farming, COVID, what's happening in the Ukraine. And that's actually quite a scary um, place to be. We're never going to be able to convince those that are anti-farming that farming's a good thing. Uh, just like we're never gonna convince the anti-vaxxers that vaccine's a good thing. So don't even enter into that discussion, which is really easy to do these days on social media. Just concentrate on pushing out the really good stories. It's it's kind of ironic in a world that we are, have never been more connected. I think that we actually have never been more disconnected and that we've, we've lost that ability just to pick up a phone and talk to somebody, talk to a real person. And so that is what I would encourage you to do when it comes to dealing with the media. Make connections, find out who your local media are. Um, I can speak from my experience with the ODT and Allied Press, um, but presumably we've got people here from the North Island, etc. There's a plethora of community um, newspapers out there and other media outlets. Make some connections, establish relationships and build some trust. And that's what everything is about, the fundamentals of everything, just people. And get some authentic storytelling out there um, instead of the public relations dribble that comes through, not all of it, but some of it that comes through my inbox um, every day. I, I guess I'm in a bit of a unique position and that I've got a foot in both camps to a certain extent and that I am actively involved in farming as well. And so I get frustrated when I see so many opportunities out there that are easy to tell good farming stories that are lost. So this is just from, from my perspective and what I want. So just um, for context, I, I look after the ODT's business in rural pages and I also edit two farming pages, papers, Central Rural Life, which covers um, Canterbury, comes out fortnightly, and Southern Rural Life, which is weekly and covers Otago and Southland. So what I want for those publications is people stories. 
and I want to hear about that. And it's interesting, I saw it flash up in the questions, the normal people, the people that aren't in the media, probably the people that don't want to be in the media and hear about what they're doing on their farm and in their communities and tying that into the catchment groups um, to tell the story of those catchment groups, but through people. It's all about personalizing stories and issues. Why has Country Calendar succeeded for so many years? Why is it New Zealand's longest running TV program? It's not rocket science, it's just about people. And people love reading about people. So stop and think for those involved with catchment groups, who are the people in your catchment groups that are interesting stories? Now, this is not necessarily the, the chairperson. This could be generational farmers, farmers diverse, div, diversifying their operations, uh, propagating their own plants, farmers with big community footprints, or really interesting backgrounds. These are the people that we want to, to hear from. It doesn't need to be hard. As I said, it can be a simple phone call. Identify these people. You don't need to put out some fancy press release. Um, but a really good example, I did a story on a catchment group in Central Otago or a couple of months ago, and they sent through um, you know, their vision and some background to it, which was really, really useful. I said, find me a farmer to talk to. They came up with a great generational farming family. I went over, sat down around the kitchen table, had a chat to them about their farming operation and incorporating the catchment group. That's perfect. That's ideal. That's exactly what, what we need. Um, and saying that, so some, that, that was a, for me, that was the perfect way of going about it. Having that noted down, it's not um, because I'm lazy, but a few bullet points as to what your group's vision is, what you're trying to achieve, a little bit of background or whatever. That saves going through all that stuff so that we can concentrate on the nice people stuff when we actually sit down to have an interview and, and all those basic facts are there. And also, if you are talking to somebody, just going back to the whole um, you know, disconnect with, with the farming sector, you know, if, you've, if you want to write down some key points about your property, whether it's farm size, um, your stock units, whatever, and, and if, it's, if you're a bit flustered about an interview, if you want to write down a few key points um, that you particularly want to get across. And also ex make sure you explain what you mean if it is non-farming folk, because you've got to think that a lot of these people don't actually know what a hoggit is, or even worse, I did have a reporter one day spell use, U-S-E-S. So just bring it back to really basic stuff. There's an opportunity to push these good news stories um, out a few way, possibly far more than what people think. And just um, looking at my patch. So for example, if we were doing a story on um, Pomahaka catchment group, for example, there's an opportunity for that to go into the Clothed Leader. There's an opportunity for it to go into the Southern Rural Life, the Gore Inn sign, so these are all allied press papers. The ODT, whether it's on the regional page, the farm page, um, or the front page, if it's really good, then those stories get um, shared onto the country website alongside Roe and Jamie's stuff uh, and other stories from the New Zealand Herald and other papers there. And then it's also pushed out on our channels. We have a Rural Life Facebook page, ODT Facebook page. Some of the individual papers have Facebook pages. So you're actually getting a really big um, audience by the time that social media is working in tandem with traditional print media uh, and it is amazing how far those stories can go and as far as story selection I'm a little bit like the, the drafter on the gate there whereas if it's a um, sort of just a straightforward planting story or some planting day or something like that I'll flick it and say to the community papers or to one of the rural papers if it's more if I see real interest um, like that sort of profile on those intergenerational families and things like that then I might snaffle that up the ODT um, but we can just direct it to where it's um, best to fit. Um, farming magazines are great and the guys involved with them are doing a tremendous job but to a certain extent, that's preaching to the converted and you want to reach the Miravale yummy mummy who, so, so that she understands the story behind the high-end produce that she's hopefully going out to get in her weekly shop. 
And I think that that's really important. Um, we always have a thing at the ODT and it's no offence to housewives, but we've always referred for many years that we're writing for the South Dunedin housewife. It has to be something that she understands. So that's something that differs with the stuff that I do as against some of those more specialised rural papers as we're trying to make sure that everybody understands it. And I think that's really important going forward as we try and increasingly reach that urban um, readership. Um, pet peeves, um, people saying, ah, but I always get misquoted. Uh, I say 99% of the time they don't. They just don't stop and think about what they said. So always stop and think about what you say. Somebody rings you up on the phone. If you need to take time, call them back. Gather your thoughts. Don't say afterwards, but I didn't think they would write it down. We'll put that in there. They're a reporter. That's what they do. They write things down. But I think in most instances, people just don't stop and think what they say. Uh, can I read the story? We have a policy that we do not send stories out to be checked unless they're advertising features. Now, there's various, mostly logistical uh, reasons behind this. If you can imagine the number of stories that are produced in a day and getting those all back in. And also, where do you draw the line? And my old boss always used to say, the Prime Minister doesn't get to read my stories, so why should I? Uh, potentially, it would turn the paper into a giant advertising feature. A, we don't have time to do it, and B, it just removes that independence. Everyone had a chance to reshape what they said or whatever, it's, it's just not doable. Um, but I always tell my guys that 100% fine to run over key points or whatever, run through their notes um, with the person that they're interviewing at the end of the interview, far better to do it then. Uh, another peeve, is the media is often treated as third class citizens. Um, if you were having an event, potentially the most important person there could well be that reporter. But a lot of the time, it's not, um, not the case. And so just sometimes stop and think about that. I think a lot of people run around, they're trying to keep sponsors or whatever happy, but actually it's the media that's there that's spreading um, you know, your message. And just stop and think about that. And um, also too, just kind of how they're treated. Um, earlier this year, I did a, well, I think it was about a four hour round trip to interview somebody for a nice positive good news farming story. I got there on the dot at the appointed time and they said, oh, oh yeah, I've just, um, I've got a, a Zoom meeting I forgot about in, in half an hour's time. So we had to talk quick. And I thought, you know, if that had been the bank manager turning up or some other professional, would they have actually done that? The story turned out okay. We, um, we talked fast and the shorthand was in overdrive, but you kind of left and went, really? You know, make that time available to go through things with people um, so that they get a good story. And then everybody benefits. Um, and I guess the other thing is just, just remember that the, the media's job is to report what people say. Uh, you might not always agree with what that is, but that doesn't make it wrong. Uh, so that's kind of that. Olivia, have you got any questions for me? <laughs> cool. Thank you, Sally. And we're going to have a bit of a panel discussion, guys. We're going to get, uh, we've got some questions, PM, more that you're coming through with as well to, to be able to get more from Sally and Rowena. But one of the questions I'm just going to throw at you now, Sally, before we do move on is, were you a farmer or a journalist first? And how did you get involved in being a journalist? And what was the drive behind that? Okay, so at school, I was always pretty strong on English. And I for whatever reason, I always just wanted to be a journalist. So I grew up on a farm. A uh, careers advisor at school told me that I wouldn't get into journalism without a um, uni degree. So I didn't know what to do. Uh, my parents said, well, we're not paying for you to go to uni if you don't know what you want to do. So um, much to my disgust, I initially, uh, I had a year off when I left school and worked on the farm for a year, which I thought to start with my throat had been cut, but actually it was probably the best thing that I could ever do. And then from there, I actually applied to 
I applied to journalism school and it was really, really difficult to get in back then. And I didn't have a degree and I didn't get in. And I was going to Lincoln to do a BCom Ag. And then they rang up to say I was first on the shortlist and I got into journalism school. And from there, so I spent um, 16 years as a, as a general journalist. So covering everything from murder trials to um, notice festivals to flower shows to 60th wedding anniversaries with a fair smattering of rural stuff in there too, um, just by virtue of background. Um, but I guess, you know, with everything that I do do and I still live on, next to the farm um, and am heavily involved there, I'm always thinking, that's kind of hard, I, I'm always thinking with a, with a farmer's hat on, I guess. Yeah. But it, it, they, they kind of go hand in hand, the, the, the two passions I'm equally as passionate about telling the stories as I am about farming. And do you think that there's a whole lot of journalists in the same boat as you at, through, across New Zealand? There is an ever decreasing source of journalists, which is a huge issue. We have uh, massive problems recruiting journalists because it's been sort of promoted as a sunset industry, wherever we heard that before. Uh, and that's a real concern. Um, but I mean, the people that I know are super passionate about what they do. Um, I recently hired Tim Cronshaw, who used to be head of rural for Fairfax for New Zealand, and before that, the press's farming editor. And he said to me, he was over management. He said, I just want to get back telling farmers' stories. And that at the heart of it's what we love doing. We love telling, journalists love telling stories for those in the rural sector, you know, about the rural sector or, or otherwise, but everybody I know is passionate about what they do. Awesome. Thank you, Sally.